this is Distant Replay. Now today's documentary recap kind of takes us down a uh, very dark road as we prepare for the Olympics. You know, one of the biggest stories about the Olympics and the USA teams has been gymnastics, especially in the last uh, five years, 10 years. Uh, when this story broke in 2016, you know, it really became the biggest story around the, the U.S. and especially around the Olympic teams and the national teams that compete, um, but especially involving such young girls was made this thing even uh, even worse. So this is a story that we're going to talk about a little bit as we went back and watched Athlete A, the Netflix documentary that really dives into the investigation. The Indianapolis Star was able to put together uh, the athletes and the survivors that came out and actually brought attention to what was happening within this uh, U.S. gymnastics program and uh, how everything unfolded and all the details that we kind of learned along the way, people that are involved and all that stuff. So this isn't going to be a, a feel-good episode at all, uh, but I think this is an important documentary, Mike, especially as we get up from the Olympics. I mean, you know, this sexual abuse cases have been much more prevalent, and thankfully, like, a lot of these things have come out of the, the dark shadows that they live in, exist in, and in every realm, right? It's not just sports. But this is a, a really big story, and I think one of the biggest ones in the last five years, even though I don't know that we still talk about it as much. Maybe we will kind of bring back some of those memories when the, the, the girls start competing again here in Tokyo. But I think this story at the time was just, I mean, nobody could believe what had happened. Yeah, and there's a reason why. You know, if you search Netflix, you know, popular Netflix documentaries, this will always be in like the top five. And it's not because the topic is heartwarming, you know, like Ben just mentioned. It's because it's, it's a very important topic to discuss because it sort of opened the lid on a huge scandal that needed to be exposed. And, you know, it tells the story of, the, of these journalists at the Indy Star um, and the work they put in to kind of expose not only Larry Nasser, but also just the corruption at, at United States Gymnastics from the top levels to the lowest levels. And... This is just one of those documentaries that, again, I think it's important for us to do, and it's a very, very well-done documentary. It is. So we'll go through that tonight. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, distantreplaypodcast.com is the website, and also YouTube as well. We'll put all our episodes up there. Please subscribe, rate, and review. We appreciate all that. Um, so this documentary really kind of centers on Athlete A, Mike, the, the first person that really stepped up and uh, brought light to what was happening within the program and uh, with the medical staff. And it was Maggie Nichols. Who I don't and I'm I don't follow gymnastics closely, Mike, but I do kind of aware of what's going on because Alabama has a really good gymnastics team year in year out. So I'm just kind of aware of of the teams that are good and some of the players that are competing just by kind of you know keeping up with just headlines and and news coverage. But um, I wasn't aware of Maggie Nichols, uh, but she is the the front and center of the face of this documentary because she was on the verge and one of the best gymnasts in America just five, six years ago and, and looked to be in line to, to make a trip to uh, Rio as part of that 2016 team. But she put it all on the line when she spoke up. And not only did it take a lot of courage to do that, but she pretty much put her whole gymnastics career on the line to do that. And, and it was uh, it was tough to watch how that all unfolded. Yeah, you know, it was tough to watch because of what she what she goes through at the beginning of the documentary as far as what she what she sacrificed to be at that top level of gymnastics competition, you know? Yeah. Online school, practices all the time, you know, sacrificing in large part of social life, you know, other than the girls on her team. And, you know, when you take all that into totality, you realize the courage that she had. And you'll see a common theme in this documentary are women with courage. And she is on that list of some, you know, her coming forward, probably realizing you know, the, the ramifications it could have, but putting that aside, you know, to do the right thing um, and, and to report what had happened to her. Like the courage that takes is unbelievable. Yeah. So when she, when she first, first spoke out, it opened the door for all these, these other athletes who had experienced similar mistreatment and to kind of say, okay, Hey, uh, this, I think this happened to me too. You know, the crazy part is, and it happen, you hear this all the time, Mike, I think in any time this is the case, but like the kids obviously are innocent, don't really know what's going on, just kind of trust. It's all about trust, right? You trust the adults and the people in the, the positions of power, not only because they control kind of your future, as Maggie Nichols pointed out, but also because you just assume they're doing what's best for you. And all, and you kind of find out as more and more girls speak up that they just kind of all thought, hey, this is this is normal, I guess, right? It kind of doesn't feel right, but it's it, this is what's been happening for years and years, so it's got to be right. 
Yeah, it's it's just they go into it in this about how that's just like the culture uh, that was within United States gymnastics. It was very much like where you you have younger girls who are very impressionable being coached by very domineering coaches, and these girls from a young age are kind of indoctrinated into a culture where you know what the coach says is right, what the coach says is not to be challenged, and I'm I'm to deal with whatever comes my way because I'm trying to get to the ultimate goal of being in the Olympics, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's just the the number of adults in this documentary that betray that they, that they cover that betrayed the trust of, you know, you know, young, young girls and young women is just startling. You, You almost can't believe that it could happen this day and age. Well, one of the things that we find out, and I know anybody that's followed this closely and done a lot and read a lot of the reporting by the Indianapolis Star, which, you know, is kind of front and center in this, and they kind of follow their investigation, which I think is also kind of gives us a unique spin to it because you kind of see how things are happening a little bit in real time, right? I, I assume, like, I don't know. I mean, maybe they staged some of these meetings and such, but it felt like you were getting a lot of the coverage of this as it was happening, but also them kind of thinking back on the, the moment itself. So that was a unique spin. But part of their investigation found that, you know, this U.S gymnastics uh, program would basically sweep any of these complaints to the side and they would only only take them to authorities if like a, uh, one of the parents like would sign off on it and, and because of that obviously like you know that's not coming up to the parents and they're not they're not they're not taking those measures because a lot of times they don't they're not aware of it that eventually this was just everything was just kind of put away in a file cabinet in a folder and never spoke of and it's, you know, how it, how it kind of morphed into what it did was, you know, you had the Indy Star doing research on, on or investigating uh, child um, abuse claims, okay? And someone during that suggested they look into how USA Gymnastics, you know, handles sex abuse complaints. And that's what they get into what Ben just mentioned about how their long-standing policy was um, not to report complaints to authorities until they were signed by a victim or a victim's parent. We're talking 54 complaints against 54 coaches over 10 years. And in essence, they're, they just turned a blind eye to sexual abuse. They would just move these coaches from gym to gym instead of dealing, you know, dealing with the complaint, you know, dealing, dealing with the issue, getting rid of the coach. They would like, they would just move the coach to a different facility. Yeah. And it, and I don't, it's, obviously you can never, there's never any scenario where, you know, this behavior is ever like justified, but I always wonder, and I know we talked about it a little bit off the air, but like, you know, what would ever give somebody the idea? Like, what are they, what are they making? What are they earning? What What's so important about what they're doing to where they would even take a chance of cover up just even one, one complaint to not fully investigate, forget about 50 plus. Like why, why are these people feel so invested into one sport, a win at all costs kind of mentality that they would even, even think to turn an eye blind eye to this? I mean, and there's there's coaches that had, you know, issues reported to them. You know, how much, like, you're covering up for someone who, who's doing something this despicable. Like, how much are you making as, as a gymnastics coach? Is it really worth it? The, these officials for USA Gymnastics that cover all this up, how much money are they actually making? Is there a dollar amount, like you said, Ben, that could be worth it to cover all this up? If you have, like, any sort of conscience whatsoever. Right. I mean, I are, you mean it, th- it, are you willing to throw away your entire life? And I know the argument to cover for up for scum, to cover up for scumbags. Right. Right. Like, like wh- why? Like, what is that person? Why would you want to associate with that person? Are they that good at their job? You can't find another gymnastics coach or you can't find another Doctor. person who treats yeah. uh, gymnastic injuries. Like the guy was that good at it. Right. Like, it's just so confusing to me. Yeah. All these cases, anytime they come out, just don't make any sense. Um, and that's a good thing, I guess, for us, Mike, that it wouldn't make any sense to us. But you know, you, you, you learn about the way they handle that and, and, and then how, you know, Nasser kind of gets involved and, and things. And he's the big name, obviously, from all this. And But it, it's it's a tough watch when you're going back and watching some of his videos he created, right, as the gymnastics doctor. And you kind of watch how he's, you know, you, you, don't, you don't see anything, but you can just kind of, you get that feeling, right? Like something's going on in these videos that you're not, that you now are aware of, but you're watching it going, this was, People are watching this, not thinking anything of it, but you just know deep down, like behind the scenes, everything that's going on 
And it's just, it's, ugh, it, it's creepy to watch. And then especially with the way he presents everything and like, you know, he's talking to kids. So he'd kind of tell us to speak at their level, like singing songs and kind of making jokes and just the whole thing. When you watch him now, it's just, it's so, so uncomfortable. And, you know, we're talking about stories that were told in, in, in this where Nasser would abu- sexually abuse the girls when the girls' parents were in the room while they were receiving yeah, treatment. I, know. I mean, like he would he would be able to like finagle his hands and their body in a way where the, you know the parent wouldn't see. And the girl who pointed this out, that Rachel Den Hollander, um, who's one of the people who come forward with the allegations against Nasser after the story, you know, that's what brought up a lot of the in terms of the huge numbers of people that brought allegations against Nasser, it all co- sort of started with uh, one of these indie news art, indie uh, star news articles, mm-hmm. and she talks about how she thought her mother could see it, right? And because her, she thought her mother could see it, she thought that her mother thought it was okay, and her mother was like, "No, I couldn't see it based on the way your body was. I couldn't see anything, you know." Yeah. And and the issues that girl went through because of that and other incidents like that. And and that Rachel Den Hollander, she wasn't an Olympic hopeful like Maggie Nichols was. Right. You know, this guy Nasser did this from like the low level club people competing in uh club athletes competing in Michigan to like upper level Olympic talent. Yeah, it didn't like matter. so he, yeah, we're talking over five hundred victims with Nasser. Yeah, that story was was crazy. And I, I imagine it happened a lot where he would be able to position himself in between the parent and the the athlete, and so they couldn't see anything that was happening, and they're probably not paying that close attention. It's a doctor that's gets providing treatment, right? I mean, how close would you normally be watching in that situation? But I can't think of, I can't imagine how many times he did that, right, with parents in the room. But to have to have that got that kind of gall to just to not even care, right? To just feel so untouchable that you would do that in front of parents too. It's just, I mean, it's a whole different level, Mike, where this guy was. Yeah, he's and he's like abusing athletes at the Olympics. Everywhere. One of the girls in this, Jamie Danch, Dancher, she was an Olympic uh, gym, gymnast. She also came forward after she saw the story in the Indy Star, and uh, that's what she described that the abuse happened at the 2000 Olympics when she was there. And you know, just well, I mean, you could you could do a whole podcast on just Nasser. You know, to be honest, <laughs> yeah. This documentary went to a lot more than that, um, but just just the stuff this guy was up to and, and how long he got away with it is just mind blowing. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's pretty tough. And you go back and like Jennifer say, was another girl that was on this, uh, another gymnast, USA national champion back in the eighties. Yeah. She defined it as, as, uh, as cruelty. That was the coaching method. Right. Yeah. And, and this brings us to the Corollis. So the Corollis for the longest time, I mean, they were, Mike, I don't know how you would describe them. They were like they became embraced by Americans so much for what not only they were able to do to bring USA gymnastics to that level, but to actually elevate them to a gold medal in Atlanta, which was like kind of the pinnacle. And he was the coach of that team. And he was just he had the accent, you know, he had a good personality, it seemed. And he was just very likable on the surface. But you come to find out, man, this is tough when you actually see they're not directly implicated, I guess, in a lot of this, but they're squarely involved. Look, I don't really like to say it, but Bella and Marta Caroli were the faces of United States gymnastics for from when they came here with Mary Lou Retton in 1984 until Marta Caroli retired after the 2016 Olympics. Yeah. You know, um, this kind of reminded me of like a college coach where they're the constant, but the players kind of rotate through. Right. Um, and unfortunately, because, you know, but it makes sense when you think about it, right? They have a certain coaching style that they come over here with from Romania. So they coach, they coach Nadia Comaneci, uh, probably the most famous gymnast of all time, I would imagine, yeah. still in 1976. The, stor- the sport starts to skew yo- younger during this time, smaller uh, girls and younger women who can, you know, do the perform – you know, the tumbles and the flips easier because they're younger. Yeah. Well, what that also creates is you can have complete control over younger girls, right? Mm-hmm. And that's what they started in Romania, and that's what they brought here. I mean, obviously in Romania, they got away with stuff they probably couldn't get away with here. You know, 
you know, slapping the girls, grabbing them by the necks, constantly weighing them and insulting them if they gain weight. Like, I don't, maybe that stuff didn't happen here, but they definitely had a lot of control over these girls, especially um, when they went to that ranch that they had in Texas, where this is where the United States team hopefuls trained. And they basically all different girls. Now, this is not just one of them in this documentary. The different women tell the story of they were so terrible, the Carolis, th that it made them think that Larry Nasser was like the nice one there. Mm -hmm. Like Nasser was the team doctor. Right. That that's how bad the Carolis were. Like, hey, look, I can go see Larry and he's going to give me candy. He's going to give me food and he's going to be nice to me. So they went into the arms of an abuser rather than, you know, uh, they'd rather deal with an abuser than Bella and Marta Caroli. Yeah. Yeah, and they and they you know they put them in those situations, those girls in those situations. But do you think you, know, you, you it was pretty eye opening to kind of learn about the Corollis in Romania and how they treated? I mean, they like literally they, they were hitting the girls right to the point where they were described as like leaving ring marks in their face. So we're not talking about just a little you know a little playful slapping or some light spanking, right? We're talking about like what sounds like full on abuse and assault, even in a lot of situations. Did, I, I know, again, Mike, we're going back to this kind of win at all cost mentality that's kind of plagued, you know, just sports in general and the culture around it. But do you think, like, you had to have known about their background before bringing them over? And they got what they wanted, right? It's, it's a ton of success, a lot of wins, but you had to know that it was kind of a you're paying a cost to get to this point. Oh, they know. I, I mean, they, they knew what they were getting. They were okay with it. You know, after 1984, when Mary Lou, Lou Retton wins, now comes all the added sponsorships, all the added money United States Gymnastics United States gymnastics starts to make. And at any cost, as we find out in this, they will protect that image that they were cultivating from Mary Lou Retton all the way to 2016 of a, of a wholesome, you know, program. Um, that, you know, has these athletes that will promote your products and will make people want to buy your products, and we will protect it at any means necessary, including covering up sexual abuse. Yeah, after I asked that question, I was like, well, what do you think, Ben? You, you know, they, they were able to cover up and ignore this abuse, sexual abuse, for so long. You would think they would have cared about physical abuse? I mean, I guess that's the answer in and of itself, but... Yeah, it does. I think one of the tough things to me, uh, 96, that moment uh, with Kerry Scrogg was, you know, one, I mean, I mean, one of the highlights that I can remember, um, especially of my youth, right? I mean, it was easy to pull for this girl was injured, showed that American spirit and the toughness and, and performed and, 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 and rose above everything else to stick the landing and win the gold for the U.S. And they definitely took any of the warm feelings about that moment, like completely away for me with like the description of, of how, and I don't know. If this is I, I, I kind of mixed feelings on this, Mike. Honestly, it was presented as she had no choice. She had to compete. You know, the, the pressure was on. She was controlled, right, by the Corollis, whatever. And even like afterwards, when he's carrying her to the podium, you know, he's kind of instructing her, wave at the fans, wave at the crowd, and she's obviously hurt, kind of crying a little bit. And it kind of they, I know they use that clip to kind of show you, okay, here's the control and the forcefulness he had. To me, like I, I was kind of mixed on, is this just a moment where I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of pressure, but wouldn't any athlete at that stage try to land that, you know, regardless of who their coach is, right? You get to that point, yeah, you're yeah. hurt. Wouldn't that still be a, a point where I don't care who's coaching you or what else, other circumstances are there. In any other situation, 95 to 99% of the athletes at that level are trying to finish that off. You know what, though? The spin that that girl, the, the lady put on it in this documentary, though, well, I will never look at that moment the same. I know. Me either. Yeah, it, it's unreal because they, they, you know, that's how they kind of end the segment about the Corollis is they say, oh, and you want a real life example about how this played out? What about in 96 with Carrie Strug? Boom. And after she goes through it, it's like, you know what? Like, I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to argue with after you find out how they were, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was crazy, man. Again, like that just just watching that was the first one. I was like, man, this is. I, 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 got, I completely have a different view of everything that happened there, unfortunately. Um, I, I'm still happy for the girls, but, yeah, everything behind the scenes is, is tough to watch. Along that same same path, so the lawsuit was finally brought up as part of this investigation. So we got to get a lot of the backstory on kind of everything that happened in gymnastics for the longest time. But we finally 
get to the lawsuit with this, which was brought on by uh, Jamie, Jamie Dantzler. And because of it, they had to bring in Nasser to be interviewed, right, by authorities. And was under arrest at the time, but wanted to ask him some questions and, you know, bring up some of the accusations. You talk about uncomfortable. Mike, again, this is one of those moments you're watching it, and it's 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 tough to actually sit and watch and hear him answer these questions and the things that were presented to him, and and him obviously start stumbling over words and clearly start stuttering and, and kind of getting out of sorts over just some very simple questioning. You knew in the back of his mind he knew what was going on and knew that he was up against it, but that again that interview and those those uh those cameras that are up in the corner black and white film right the interrogation room cameras again that was probably one of the the tougher moments of the doc yeah because you know remember you have the way he tried to explain it away was telling the investigator like well you probably wouldn't know because you're not a doctor but this is how we do this kind of treatment and that yeah. kind of treatment he tried to explain it away that way and, and the investigator is like not buying it you know and uh you know there's different Basically, what really kind of, I don't want to say this is what got Nasser in trouble because I think there's other, other ways they could have got him, but he basically said um, that he never, like, he never did, you know, certain types of treatment with the girls. And after he says, like, hey, look, I, I, we've, he's never performed uh, certain types of treatment with us. After the story sprint, uh, prints with the Indy Star, they get like several dozen reports from gymnasts saying, like, no, he did that. What he said he didn't do, he did exactly that to me. <laughs> you know? Right. So his own kind of hubris and arrogance is what ends up nailing him in the end. And obviously, you don't feel sorry for the guy. Um, but yeah, that scene with him answering the questions, like, it was just someone you could tell who knows he was caught. And I think it might have been his lawyer who actually presented that defense. I don't remember. Maybe it was him. One of the two. But either way, yeah, that comment um, is what kind of blew everything wide open and got people, more people, to speak out than Hatton. And another part of this, they're on the same time too. That they kind of point out in this documentary was that you know even with all this going on, all these allegations going on around him, Nasser was running for the school board at Holt uh, at Holt School, I guess where he was living, and he received almost three thousand votes for that position. Wow while in the middle of all these sexual assault allegations. Yeah, because you have to remember now, when these sexual assault allegations were brought against Nasser, not everyone believed the victims, okay? Yeah. Like, a lot of people attacked them and said, oh, they well, they just want money and attention. You know, the, a couple of them were gymnasts. You know, they, they called them, like, failed gymnasts who just wanted money and attention. You know, and this is a, a guy who was beloved in his community, you know? Yep. To the point where, like Ben said, he gets 22% of the school board vote literally in the middle of all this. Um, and it's, it, 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 again, it's just another of a long line of head scratchers that they go through. But you're right. I mean, he, he did a good job of kind of building this image up by starting a foundation, right? I think working with autistic kids, um, you know, would help train and, and work with children. Like, he did everything to put up a front. Right. That would make anybody kind of be like, oh, there's no way that's happening. This is a good guy that actually cares about our community that has worked with so many kids. Then you think about it like, you know, that then it happens a lot with with people and these predators in the situation. But, you know, even more probably even more so beyond that is like you, you set those situations up to put yourself probably around those those kids and those children, because that's where you want to be. Yeah, he's a, so he's a sociopath. We, we cover a lot of those in our true crime episodes. Yeah. He's just a sociopath. Yeah. So he, I mean, obviously the the case um, wasn't too difficult for the prosecution, and you know he was obviously found guilty, sentenced to forty to one hundred and twenty five years in two thousand eighteen on three counts of criminal sexual assault, and I think there's been a ton of other lawsuits that have come up um, against him. I think over. The last I saw one other story, I think over 150 federal and state lawsuits have been filed against him, Michigan State, U.S. Olympic Committee, gymnastics, like everybody he was involved with, which is a lot of high profile organizations, obviously, were were brought into lawsuits. But, you know, uh, beyond that, you know, I think if we even mentioned Steve Penny in this at all. No, we haven't. So just to put a to, to put a bow on Nasser to get him kind of out of the conversation because he's tough to talk about. He took a plea deal. Part of the plea deal was the victims had a right to give an impact statement about how what he did to them impacted them. 
Um, and we've seen this in other uh, documentaries and true crime episodes that we've done. It's, 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 um, it's not unheard of. And like, you know, there was countless athletes who came and gave impact statements in front of Nasser. One of those was Maggie's uh, mother. Uh, she spoke for her because Maggie was attending college at the time, probably. And it comes out that she is athlete A. You know, she is the athlete A referred to it in the uh, in the court documents. Allie Raceman was probably the biggest name to speak. Mm-hmm. She's been a multiple time um, Olympian uh, that Rachel Den Hollander spoke as well. She actually got a standing ovation in court, which you don't see that much. So he not only has to go through whatever he's going to go through in jail, but he had to go through all those impact statements. And again, the courage of all these victims to come forward and talk, um, I think, is one of the, the, the most meaningful parts of this documentary. Yeah. And, and I, I'm glad you brought that up because that was I remember when that happened, like just the coverage of that when these girls were coming out, you know, by the day and speaking out in front of them, how tough how, how tough it had to be for them. And you could just like it was enjoyable to watch Nasser have to sit through all that. Yeah. And it was it was, uh, you know, you never feel any way but glad when anything bad is happening to that guy, you know. Right. Um, but getting back to what Ben's talking about, the other huge part of this is the USA Gymnastics role in this. OK that they allowed all of this to fester and not to report claims of of child sexual abuse um, for years. And at the forefront of that was the head of USA Gymnastics at the time, a guy named Steve Penny. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what he did to Maggie Nichols' Nichols parents and to the countless athletes over the years is like, I mean, if you, I don't really want to get into ranking it, but it's not as bad as Nasser, but he is, is, to allow it to happen is pretty, pretty bad. Like not pretty bad. It's, it's like deplorable. Um, and I'm trying not to go nuts right now. You know what I mean? It's one of those things where you get so frustrated, but his role in all this cannot be understated. No, it cannot. It cannot. He resigned uh, in 2017 as the president of USA gymnastics. And I mean, since that time they've blown up everything, but you know, watching kind of his last, I'm sure he was on his high horse in 2016 watching that team compete and just the incredible group of uh, USA gymnasts that, that won gold. But, you know, Maggie Nichols, that's the other kind of conclusion here, is she she was on the verge of making that team. And, I mean, by all accounts, she deserved a spot on that team. Not only she was hit, she won and been, you know, one of the top two or three all-around performers in the country. But she finished, I think, sixth, right, top five, Girls go on the team. She finished sixth, head of even Gabby Douglas, who finished seventh um, in that competition to the to trials to make the team. And so they take the top five, and then they take three alternates that come, right, in case girl can't compete. And she doesn't make either. Gets left out of the alternates, despite the fact, again, that her performance and everything about her and what she had done leading up to that point, everything indicated and pointed to a spot on that team. But she didn't get it, and they they refer refer back to the fact that she spoke out. And because she did, they punished her, and they made it clear that you're not going to compete, you spoke out, you're not going to be on this team. And the fact that she didn't get that spot, dude, that was pretty – that was hard, man. And and especially for, like you talked about early on, everything that she sacrificed and her parents sacrificed to get her there. But to clearly not make that team – and I don't follow – we don't follow gymnastics, Mike, in a week in, week out. I wonder if this was even talked about at the time. Like, how does she not get a spot on this team? Yeah, yeah, I, I can't remember it being talked about at the time because kind of like you know we you turn, know. tune into the the Olympics and the girls that are on the screen are the girls you're watching, you know. Right. You don't really know, but look, this girl uh, uh, Maggie was like we're talking. She was second in the world. Uh, sorry, second in the U.S. at the United States Championships to Simone Biles in 2015. Right. So we're talking about like an upper upper echelon, not someone that was on the bubble. Uh, she had an injury leading into the trials, still performed pretty well. It's left off the team and left left off as an alternate also. Right. And, you know, you, you can't help but think it's retaliation for her coming forward. And it's alluded to to be the fact. And look, just like how she handled herself in this in this documentary and how her parents handled themselves. Yeah. Like just classy all the way around. I mean, she's in this doc. She's in this a lot. And she's talks about everything that happened to her, everything, the fallout with USA Gymnastics and what it led to. And the fact that, like, she's, like, the way she comes across, like, you just hope. I know we both have um, we both have girls, Ben. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you hope that, like, when your girls get older, they have, like, the confidence and the, you know, and just the, just the aura that she has because she's just, 
you know, she just seems like a great kid. Yeah. And she took, you know, her, just her perspective on everything is important and, and, and refreshing to see, right. She, she spun this and made it a positive in her life and understood like, you know, her career was done with the U S but she still wanted to compete and she went to Oklahoma and no surprise, Mike, she's been the best gymnast in the country the last two years winning the all around. Yeah. Yeah. And that's cool to see that at least she was able to find peace with gymnastics, compete at a still a high level, have more fun. It sounded like, you know, she hit on that how much fun she's having at, at Oklahoma and what's better than having fun playing sports and succeeding, you know? doesn't get any better than that, yeah, especially just, after what she went through. Their description of going to a college team with coaches that care about you and make it fun, like how that was completely different than anything she experienced, you know, preparing for the U.S., which I get it, Mike. It, you got to sacrifice a lot to get to that level, but, you know, it brings up that great debate. Like, and if not, I'm not talking about sexual assault stuff. Obviously, that's not part of the conversation, but just that sacrifice. At what point does do you have to sacrifice or should a little bit of fun be involved, right? That's always the question. Uh, but to, to hear the discrepancy between those two programs, the U.S. versus like a college, like a very high level college program was nine day. Yeah, it is really crazy. The stark difference. And and uh, I'm glad she got to experience it. And, uh, you know, for her, it seems like, you know, she's she's on her way to getting back on the straight and narrow and kind of moving past all this, which is awesome to see. All right, Mike, what would you what would you give this this uh, documentary? What's your review here? I mean, the topic matter is not, like we said, heartwarming, but it's a very, very well done documentary. And I thought the fact that there's still journalism like this being done in America is very, was very, very good to see. Yeah. These reporters in this, they don't come off with any kind of agenda. They just come off with gathering facts and investigating and reporting on those facts and investigations. And I thought they, they come across great in this. I agree. I agree. It was really, very really well done. And uh, you learn a lot if you haven't paid close attention to the trial and everything, the details of gymnastics uh, through the years in the U.S. It's it's tough, but hopefully things have been cleaned up. I know this team and Simone Biles, who is the the top gymnast in the world, who does some things that are hard to even believe is possible by any person. But she'll be fun to watch. Hopefully, just things are better, and and uh, and they have to be better. But hopefully, they are hundred percent on the up and up, and and you know everything is positive. The impact they're making on these gymnast lives moving forward. But yeah, this was uh, not a fun documentary, but one that you should watch if you're looking for something on Netflix. So Mike, we'll close it out on that note. We'll have more documentaries coming up. We've got some more Olympic covers, some events we are going to do as part of the podcast. I don't think we have any, we don't have any true crime Olympic tie in, right? Not yet. Okay. No, nope. maybe you'll find that. If not, we have other true crime though coming your way. So if you have anything you want to recommend, send it to us. Leave us a comment on YouTube. Uh, send us an email. Hit us on Twitter, Instagram, or distantreplaypodcast.com.